Uh, I welcome you all to this digital event on the self-care. I'm pleased to moderate this session. I'm Mrs. Manjiri Gherat, the Vice President of International Pharmaceutical Federation, Fellow of FIP. I'm also Vice President of Indian Pharmaceutical Association and the Principal and Principal K.M. Kundanani Pharmacy Polytechnic from India. Before we start with this self-care event, I would like to make some announcements. Maybe many of you are already familiar with it because you have been attending these FIP events. So this webinar is being recorded and live streamed on, via YouTube. The recording will be available on FIP website, www.fip.org. You may ask questions using the Q&A box. So we encourage you to put your questions in Q&A box and not in chat box. You are welcome to provide us the feedback at webinars at fip.org and this will help us to uh, continue our progress and improve our further events. If you're not yet a member of this global pharmacy family, I appeal you to become a member of FIP and please have a look at our website, uh, the membership uh, underscore registration icon. Can we go to the next slide, please? And FIP would like to profusely thank Rekit for supporting this online program. So thank you very much to Rekit for all the support and collaboration for the self-care series. Next one. So today's program consists of, I'm here, Manjari Gharat, uh, introducing, I'll be introducing the panelists and we have two eminent panelists today. Uh, one is Ruth Brudling from UK, and she'll be presenting on lifestyle advice and choice of medicines for common GI conditions. And then an interesting session on case studies by Anya St. Clair Jones, and who is also from UK. Then we will be waiting for your Q&A questions, and we'll be discussing about this Q&A uh, answers to the, your questions in our panel discussion towards the end of the session. Next one, please. So as all of you agree that the pharmacist as a healthcare provider have a great role to play in supporting the responsible self-care. So we have a series of digital events on the self-care and today's event is the episode number 13 out of our program of 17 events on self-care, shaping the future of self-care through pharmacy. So, uh, Today's learning objectives where we are focusing on the self-care for the gastrointestinal problems. So the learning objectives are list out the common GI symptoms and their impact on people, discuss treatment options that enable people with gastrointestinal symptoms to self-care, identify and suggest approaches to addressing lifestyle factors causing the GI symptoms, and discuss the role of pharmacy team to support people with GI symptoms to self-care. I'm sure all of you are finding this as a very relevant, very interesting and exciting topic because in everyday routine, we get so many people who come to us with many of GI complications and GI problems. And with changing world today, with our changing lifestyle, uh, everybody some or other time has some of the GI symptoms or some of the people have it chronically and they are always uh, at work, they are always going for the self care than going to the healthcare than going to the medical professionals so pharmacist has a huge opportunity and wide scope to influence the patient behavior and support the patients in the responsible self care so i'm very pleased that we have eminent panelists today and our first panelist is Ruth Rudling, and she's the advanced clinical pharmacist for specialty medicines at Mid Yorkshire NHS Trust. She supports the gastroenterology patients, so her focus is totally gastroenterology. She's specialized in it. She's also, she has also been an independent prescriber. She's a member of United Kingdom Clinical Pharmacy Association, as well as, guest, uh, as, well as gastroenterology and hepatology committee. So Ruth, I welcome you here and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. 
and we look forward to your presentation on this very interesting topic. And before you start, I would just like to tell all our attendees that you will receive a certificate of attendance after the webinar. So it's all uh, yours, Ruth, over to you. And thank you again. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you're fine. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk about lifestyle advice and choice of medicines for common um, gastrointestinal conditions. Um, next slide, please. So the aims and objectives of this session are to know the common treatment options for common conditions. I'm gonna focus on irritable bowel syndrome, dyspepsia, alcohol excess, nausea and vomiting. Um, you should be able to offer patients lifestyle advice for common GI conditions, know when to refer patients on and um, importance of signposting patients um, to where they can get more information and help. Next slide, please. So irritable bowel syndrome to start with. So what is it? So it's a common chronic recurrent illness. Um, IBS is the most common functional um, gastrointestinal condition um, worldwide um, with prevalence rates ranging from 10 to 15%. There's actually no recognized pathology and no specific causes. Um, it's, it's expected that patients with uh, irritable bowel syndrome have um, intestinal activity that's increased um, with um, focus on contractility and ele electrical activity, um, but it's probably exacerbated um, due to a stimulus rather than a physical pathology. It's linked to food intolerances and there's an association between emotion and gut motility um, and stress and things like that can worsen it. So some of the symptoms of um, irritable bowel syndrome are stomach cramps or pains, which are usually worse after eating and relieved by defecation, um, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, um, also flatulence, nausea, um, um, patients can also present with bladder symptoms or faecal incontinence as well, so you just need to be aware of those uh, aspects. So when to refer a patient, so red flag symptoms, so unexplained significant weight loss, um, blood in the stool or rectal bleeding, ongoing change in bowel habit, fever, shortness of breath, palpitations, pale skin and uh, abdominal masses. So these are um, leading to differential diagnosis, which include um, conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease, um, malignancy such as colorectal cancer, um, infections such as Clostridium difficile, uh, diverticular disease, pancreatitis, gallstones. Uh, next slide, please. So treatment options for irritable bowel syndrome. So we've got antispasmodic agents such as hyacine, uh, which is an antimuscarinic. It relaxes the smooth muscle to relieve pain, um, but it should be avoided in patients with conditions such as glaucoma and uh, myasthenia gravis. We've got antidiarrheal agents such as loperamide, which reduces um, motility. Um, it needs to be used with caution in patients who uh, have other conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease and antibiotic associated diarrhea. We've also got codeine, um, which can alter the motility um, and is possibly anti-secretory. Um, it may precipitate conditions such as toxic megacolon, so it needs to be used with caution. It can also have um, other adverse effects such as CNS depression and respiratory depression. Um, it can also delay gastric emptying. So next option is uh, laxative. So you'd first start with a bulk forming uh, laxative, uh, such as fiber gel, which includes, increases the bulk or weight of the stool, which stimulates the bowel. Um, but these can take two to three days to work. Second option for laxatives would be an osmotic laxative, such as lactulose, which draws water into the, the bowel um, to soften the stool, to make it easier to pass. This can also take two to three days to work. So need to be giving this kind of information to patients when we're starting them on these treatments so that they're not expecting um, an immediate uh, result. Third option would be a stimulant such as Senna, which stimulates the muscles um, in the lining of the gut um, to promote, promote movement throughout uh, of the stool through the bowel. And this can take six to 12 hours to work. So usually better taken on an evening before bed to have an effect in the morning. Um, 
And another option for the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome are antidepressant agents. So tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline can be used to help manage the pain caused by uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, NICE recommends starting at a low dose such as 10 milligrams in the evening and titrate slowly um, at stages of 10 milligrams every two weeks um, to a maximum of 30 milligrams at night. Um, we also have other options such as fluoxetine. You just go back to the previous slide. So fluoxetine is another antidepressant that can be used second line. Um, it's also worth explaining to patients that these can take up to two weeks to have an effect. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So the do's and don'ts of irritable bowel disease. Um, so it's important to uh, complete a food diary to find out if you've got triggers. Um, triggers can include uh, all sorts of things such as um, dairy products or um, high fat or greasy foods. So it's worth considering a low FODMAP diet. So FODMAP is a group of fermentable carbohydrates um, that aggravate the gut symptoms in sensitive people. Um, they're polyabsorbed in the small intestine and are osmotically active, leading to abdominal symptoms, as well as increasing the amount of water in the colon. So foods include things like garlic and onion, um, fructose containing um, items such as figs, mangoes, things like that. Lactose containing products such as milk, yogurt, soft cheese, as well as blackberries and low calorie sweeteners that can be found in things like sugar free gum. It's important to um, ensure your patient is remaining well hydrated, especially if they have an excessive diarrhea. Um, promote regular exercise, consider probiotics, uh, consider relaxation and mental well being management, um, things like um, mindfulness and things like that. So what not to do. So don't delay or skip meals. Don't eat too quickly. Don't eat lots of fatty or spicy foods. Don't drink more than three cups of tea or coffee in a day. And don't drink lots of alcohol or fizzy drinks. It, uh, a useful place to refer patients to is a uh, Gut UK or IBS network. They're useful reference sources. Next slide, please. So next on to dyspepsia, what is this? So dyspepsia is pain or discomfort in the upper abdomen for at least 12 weeks of the preceding 12 months. It's recurrent and intermittent. Symptoms can include burning sensation in the middle of the chest, unpleasant sour taste in the mouth caused by stomach acid, cough or hiccups that keep coming back, hoarse voice, bad breath, bloating and feeling sick. So common causes of dyspepsia are um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, peptic ulceration and non-ulcer dyspepsia. An average prevalence in the community is 39% when patients with mainly reflux symptoms are included and 23% when they're not. Next slide, please. So when to refer, so red flag symptoms. So any signs of GI bleeding, um, progressive uncontrolled weight loss, dysphagia, persistent vomiting, iron deficiency anemia and epigastric mass. So these are highlighting your differential diagnosis for uh, dyspepsia, which include things like stomach uh, cancer, H. pylori associated ulcers, uh, cardiac, bilary or pancreatic diseases, um, and potentially hiatus hernia as well. Next slide, please. So treatment options. So we've got um, antacids and alginates. So, Aluminium, con aluminium containing um, antacids can cause constipation and magnesium containing um, antacids can have a laxative effect. So it's all, always worth um, explaining that to your patients when offering this as a treatment option. Um, we want to avoid bismuth containing antacids because bismuth absorption can cause neurotoxicity and is constipating as well. Um, some antacids have high calcium um, content, so it's worth noting that this can cause hypercalcemia. Um, some antacids can also contain uh, cymetochrome, which is useful for things like flatulence and things like that. Um, alginates are really useful because they can create a raft over the surface of the stomach contents, which re reduces um, reflux. Um, and they can affect the absorption of other medicines, so to be used with caution, um, ensure that patients know when to take it in relation to their other medications. Uh, another option are proton pump inhibitors. 
So these cause irreversible blockade of the hydrogen potassium adenosine triphosphatase system of the gastric parietal cells. Um, these can take uh, four to eight weeks to work. They can also cause diarrhea and, and they can put patients at increased risk of complications such as uh, Clostridium difficile. Um, proton pump inhibitors are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 um, pathway. So it needs to be um, noted that to patients um, if they're on things like um, warfarin or phenytoin, it can affect the clearance of things like that. Um, also, um, omeprazole can reduce the efficacy of things like clopidogrel. Um, that's the main uh, proton pump inhibitor that can do that. So it's useful to know for patients on that and you can recommend an alternative such as a wansoprazole or isomeprazole. Um, it's best to, to take them immediately before meals as well. So third option, uh, histamine receptor antagonist to reduce gastric out acid output by histamine receptor blockade. They're less effective than proton pump inhibitors. Um, need to be used in caution with patients with uh, liver and kidney impairment. And um, we recently had a recall of renitidine in the UK due to um, a problem in the manufacturing process. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. So do's and don'ts for dyspepsia. So cut down on tea, coffee and fizzy drinks because uh, drinking too much caffeine uh, and alcohol can lower the um, tone of the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, it's recommended that you eat smaller meals more often rather than three large meals a day. Um, it, it's useful to prop your head and shoulders up in bed to prevent stomach acid from coming back up whilst you sleep. If, if you're overweight, it's, it's best to try and lose some weight because that's going to have a detrimental effect. Find ways to relax um, the mindfulness things that I mentioned previously. So what not to do? So don't eat three to four hours before going to bed. Don't have rich, spicy and fatty foods. Don't take aspirin or uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen as this can make things like indigestion worse. Um, recommend smoking cessation to patients and signpost them to um, places that can help them with that and um, offer nicotine replacement therapy if necessary. Um, and don't wear tight fitting clothing, clothing especially around the waist because that's going to exacerbate it as well. Next slide please. So alcohol excess. So this is a significant public health issue, um, especially following um, COVID lockdown um, in countries led to social isolation, financial difficulties, uncertainties for the future and redistrib redistribution of healthcare workforce, um, which put pressure on other clinical services. Um, alcohol is the third leading cause of preventable death in the USA. Um, it cost the UK economy £25.1 billion in 2006 7 and it's increasing since then. Uh, dependency is not de defined by a given quantity of alcohol to consume, but resultant behaviours and their consequences. So, low risk drinking. Uh, men and women are advised not to drink more than 14 units of alcohol uh, a week on a regular basis. And if you are going to drink 14 units, it's best to spread the evenly over a few days um, rather than in one binging session. Um, and it's important to have alcohol free days as well. So criteria for alcohol dependency. So continue drinking despite physical or psychological consequences. Um, neglect of other activities, normal daily activities. Um, an inordinate amount of time spent drinking or recovering. Drinking more or over a longer period than it intended. Inability to control drinking. Building up a tolerance. Withdrawal symptoms on cessation of alcohol and drinking to relieve or avoid withdrawal symptoms. Next slide, please. So some of the risks of alcohol misuse. So we've got short term effects, so accidents and injuries such as head injuries, you know, falling over, things like that. Violent behaviour or being a victim of violence. Alcohol poisoning, uh, loss of possessions. And then some of your long term health risks are liver disease, pancreatitis, stroke, heart disease, and cancers such as mouth, bowel, or breast. Next slide, please. So the case questionnaire is a really useful tool um, when speaking to patients about their alcohol um, and trying to highlight if there is a, a concern or issue there. Um, so these are the questions that you'd um, ask. So have you ever felt the need to cut down on your drinking? Have people annoyed you about criticizing your drinking? 
Have you ever felt bad or guilty about your drinking? And have you ever had to have a drink first thing in the morning to steady your nerves or hangover? Next slide, please. So the management for alcohol excess. So um, we'd recommend stopping alcohol, but this needs to be done with the assistance of an alcohol uh, misuse service um, to prevent withdrawal complications such as seizures and things like that. Um, recommend that patients speak to think, uh, places like Alcoholics Anonymous, Alcohol Change UK. Can offer detoxification, um, whether that be an inpatient or outpatient, we can use products such as Librium. Um, psychological support, so patients need to show readiness to change. Um, you can't force somebody to come off alcohol, they need to be ready and willing to make that change to their life. Um, need to get to the root cause of why they're drinking by offering counselling and cognitive behavioural therapy. Um, it could be that it's following a, a life stress or something um, that needs addressing. Uh, med medications can also be used to maintain abstinence. So we've got things like a campersate, which stimulates the GABA transmission and maintains abstinence in 12 to 18 percent in comparison to placebo. Um, and disulfram, which is also used um, not as much anymore, um, it causes nausea and vomiting with alcohol. Next slide, please. So that moves us on to nausea and vomiting. So we've got different causes of nausea and vomiting. So we've got painless causes of vomiting, such as infective, such as viral gastroenteritis, food poisoning, uh, viral labyrinthitis. We've got mechanical obstructions, such as pyloric stenosis, uh, duodenal obstruction, um, esophageal cancers. We've got alcoholic gastritis, which is characterized by early morning retching, uh, usually small volumes and blood stained. Now we've got acute liver failure, such as in uh, paracetamol overdose um, and acute fatty liver. We've got metabolic causes such as Addison's disease and diabetes. We've also got causes of vomiting without nausea, so intracranial tumours. So we need to ask patients about any headaches or double vision um, and examine them for any gait disorders. Um, raised intracranial pressure, so look for things like nystagmus. Uh, we've got encephalitis, meningitis, migraine, and then we've got cyclical vomiting, which usually occurs in two to three month cycles in children's teenagers and young adults. And it may be accompanied by migraine. So um, products such as beta blockers can help with that. Next slide, please. So treatment options we've got. So we've got dopamine receptor antagonists, such as uh, procolaperazine, metoclopamide or domperidone. These antagonize the D2 receptor within central chemoreceptor trigger zone. Um, they increase the lower esophageal sphincter tone and speed gastric emptying, so they're prokinetic. Um, just need to be cautious with some of these. So metoclopamide had a re recent MHRA warning uh, due to the risk of extrapyridomal disorders. So this needs to be used for a maximum of five days at a time and the maximum dose is 10 milligrams three times a day so it's worth uh, highlighting that to patients that they shouldn't exceed that um, and then domperidone um, was also issued a MHRA warning um, due to cardiac disorders so it needs to be used at the lowest effective dose for the lowest period of time uh, should not exceed one week's worth of treatment it's contraindicated in patients with um, cardiac problems especially with uh, conduction. Um, so when supplying these kind of medications to patients, we need to ensure that we're asking the correct questions, that we do exclude that they have any of these cardiac problems. We need to ensure that it's been used only for nausea and vomiting because that's how it's licensed now. Um, we need to ensure that they're only using it for the shortest possible time at the lowest possible dose. Um, and they need to be aware to seek medical uh, attention immediately if um, they experience any heart-related problems such as a regular heartbeat uh, or fainting. Another option is the serotonin receptor antagonist such as andonsetron. So this blocks the 5-HT3 receptor dependent uh, afferent impulses to vomiting centers in the medulla. Um, it can cause severe constipation, so patients need to be aware of that. Um, it can also prolong the QT interval, so we need to avoid concomitant medications that can also prolong QT interval, so ensure that we ask patients what are the medications they're taking before issuing these medications. Um, and it can also cause serotonin syndrome, so we need to avoid other medications that affect serotonin levels such as sertraline. Next slide, please. 
So the do's and don'ts for nausea and vomiting. So ensure that patients um, get plenty of fresh air. Uh, recommend that they take regular sips of a cold drink. Um, suggest they could drink ginger or peppermint tea. And it's best to eat small, more frequent meals. And don't eat or cook strong smelling foods. Don't eat hot fried or greasy foods. Don't eat too quickly. Don't have large drinks with meals. Don't lie down soon after eating and don't wear clothes that are tight around the waist. Next slide, please. That's all from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ruth. That was comprehensive and very, very clear. I enjoyed learning from you or refreshing my knowledge about the GI conditions. And we will come back to you. There are some questions and I'll come back to you towards the end of the session. So thank you again. Uh, here we welcome our next speaker for today, Anya St. Claire Jones. She's the consultant pharmacist for gastroenterology. She works with University Hospitals Sussex. You know, she, is, she promotes the pharmacy services in gastroenterology. She also has been an independent prescriber. She is a member of United Kingdom Clinical Pharmacy Association, and she uh, and she is the committee member of Gastroenterology and Hepatology Committee. And uh, in 2021, she received uh, an award from UKCPA. So congratulations, Sanya, and thank you for accepting mm -hmm. our invitation and being with us. And we look forward to the interesting case studies which you are going to present now. So over to you. Well, thank you very much and good evening to those who have evening and good morning to those who have morning. Um, thank you very much for asking me to come and present our UK practice on um, GI complaints. And I just thought I'd talk a little bit about what you might see in community with constipation and um, diarrhea. So please could I have the next slide. Um, I had a... 70 year old late gentleman who came for advice with intermittent constipation. We knew him quite well, but he was quite a, a private person, didn't really want to talk too much about himself, but eventually came to seek advice for, for his constipation. So what do you have to ask as a pharmacist? Um, the first thing is obviously you need to know the symptoms how long they have persisted, the history of the symptoms, is he experiencing diarrhea with the constipation or is it just uh, not being able to open his bowels? Is it changing diet? Has he changed his diet, his medication, anything around lifestyle, routines? Has he got pain? Is there blood or mucus in the stool? And any has he tried anything else? And um, his answers in the next slide, uh, were showed that he had difficulty opening his bowels for five days. Um, he in the past had it, but it just resolved itself after a few few days. And um, this time his symptoms are fairly long. He has newly pain when he opens his bowels, but there is no blood and no mucus. He hasn't lost weight. There's no change in lifestyle or any new medication. And he tells me that it happens a few times a year, particularly during the summer in the hot, hotter months. And he takes regularly some Merlox. Therefore, next slide, please. Um, he, we, I decided that it's probably constipation, A, due to his advanced age, but also due to dehydration. When you're older, your gut becomes slightly dysfunctional. That's just being part of being old. So what is constipation it's when you have fewer bowel movements than normal and normal doesn't mean opening your bowels every day normal could be every other day or even in every three days but he had abdominal pain some patients experience cramping cramping nausea and particularly straining during bowel movements. So this is all to do because of his advanced age and because he mainly experiences it in the summer, it's probably due to dehydration as well. Elderly patient, well, we all don't drink probably enough, but particularly elderly patients find it difficult to get the amount of fluid we need. Next slide, please. Um, the causes usually are multifactorial. It's uh, usually due to 
all sorts of factors that contribute. Um, they could be systemic, neurological, so or medications, other organic causes, um, IB, IBS, we just heard about that. Um, it could also be little activity, they don't move as much anymore, that the diet isn't, hasn't got enough fiber, there isn't enough fluid intake. And sometimes psychological issues, particularly when they were problems as children, there's all sorts of things. And for us pharmacists, the psychological issue is quite a problem. If you open this Pandora box, you, you might be slightly in over your head. So be careful when you ask about uh, as if there is any traumas in the past. Um, family history of constipation, next. So what do you advise this patient? Well, first of all, you say, what's your diet? Can you include more high fibers in your diet? We think we should need about 30 grams a day. So something like vegetables, pulses, fruit, cereal. Avoid low fiber diets. So anything processed, not too much dairy or meat, just, you know, a healthy uh, vegetable diet would be good. Plenty of fluid. HUK says six to eight drinks per day of about 200 mils each. So that's a normal glass. That's quite a lot. And it's not coffee. It's not tea. They're all diuretics. Um, so you lose water um, and also reduce the alcohol intake. Make sure you're within the recommended limit. And also... Tell them when they have the urge to go, that they uh, go and open the, the, the bowels. Holding in is, is sort of um, getting the body used to not going to the loo. So maybe it sometimes helps to give them a, a, a regular schedule to go so that in the morning they have some kind of routine and they then go to open the bowels at this very similar time after breakfast or something. And then, of course, always a medication review. And um, the advice is also that if this all doesn't work, to return again to discuss, particularly to come and talk to the GP or go to the GP if they have continuous pain, if it gets worse, and if there's blood or mucus, they need to go and see a GP. So the next, the continuation, so oh, medication that causes constipation, there's a whole list here, I'm sure you can read through. The ones we probably are worried about are aluminium containing antacids. He was on Mayalox, he needs, so we, we change the antacid he was on to uh, nalginate probably. Um, iron, iron supplements, elderly patients often are on iron supplements because they're not as good as absorbing the iron anymore, calcium supplements, so that needs to be reviewed, do they need it, can we change the product, it's just a review you can do, and then all sorts of, you know, antidepressants, all the, the, the normal uh, medications you expect. Next. Um, here are just a, a, a few lists of organic disorder, you know, neurological, are they structural abnormalities? So if it doesn't resolve, the GP needs to review the patient. But I think in the next slide, the patient came back and uh, he sort of had some success, but it was still had episodes of constipation. So in a way, this first line treatment of uh, self-management and lifestyle changes uh, has slightly failed or hasn't been fully effective. So as a second line, we then can use the pharmacological options. And you've got um, bulk forming laxatives, but if you offer bulk forming laxatives, you need to make sure the patient drinks adequate fluids. And if the patient cannot drink, then you need to consider a osmotic laxative. So you need to discuss with the patient really what suits you. If the stool is difficult to pass and but is soft, then you could consider adding a stimulant laxative. Next. Uh, here are the bulk forming laxatives. Um, the onset as uh, Ruth said is two to three days and probably don't take it immediately before bed because it can sort of fill up your, you, you might affect your, your sleep. Um, 
be very careful who you give it to. If you give it to some atonic patients, patients with ileus, you're obviously uh, creating a, a risk of um, megacolon. Particularly opioid-induced uh, constipations can be a problem because they uh, the, the gut is paralyzed. Or therefore, if you create more bulk, uh, again, you could cause a problem. Next. So the stimulant laxatives are uh, bisocodyl, Senna, we all know them. They're, and I've put the list here on how soon they work. They all have different ways of working. Interestingly, is considered suppositories. I know in the UK, patients don't like suppositories, but actually they can be really, really effective, particularly glycerol suppositories. But as I said, stimulant laxatives are really for short term only, and really only when you when you really can't pass but have a soft stool. Next, the fecal softeners, um, they are when you have pellet stools, so lots of little hard areas, and they just help wetting these, the feces and make it much softer to pass. And often they have a little bit of stimulant, like the doctor said, stimulant and softening actions. However, the arachis oil, which we often use in hospital, um, there is an issue around peanut allergy. And lastly, we have the osmotic. Next. We have the osmotic laxatives, um, which are particularly for heart stools. So you have uh, not the pellet, you have a, a very solid heart stool and all they do is draw water in. Um, I particularly don't like lactulose because it really causes flatulence because there is the fermentation of the lactulose into methane. So people complain a lot about that. Macrogol is currently the choice of osmotic in the UK. Um, magnesium hydroxide is often abused because there is this theory that um, you lose weight with it. And therefore, if you have body dysmorphic problems, so um, bulimia or anything, it often gets used for this, so be careful. It seems to be, you know, on the net. And magnesium sulfate is when you really want to open the bowels quickly. So it's often in endoscopy uh, preparations. And phosphate enemas, as usual, be careful, you know, with the renal and patients with renal and cardiac problems. With all these, it's really, really important that they have adequate fluid intake because you're drawing the water into the colon. Therefore, you must make sure that you are um, hydrating enough to replace that fluid. Um, contraindications as often, obviously, if you have inflammation, obstructions or perforations, it's, it's, it's uh, inappropriate to prescribe these. Next. There is a safety concern with the stimulants. Again, just like the magnesium hydroxide, it's often used for eating disorders because there is to think that if you, if you open your bowels, you lose weight. And also older people have a problem with long-term use. The, but the gut gets used to it, therefore becomes lazy. And actually the, um, the, the propulsion or, or, or the, the um, the gut just doesn't um, evacuate anymore. And we have a problem probably with our older population, I say, um, who might have been using this in the 50s and 60s. It was very common to use stimulant laxatives nearly every day. So their gut is probably uh, damaged through this continuous use on stimulants. Next. So the other thing I thought is probably just how to know which uh, management in pregnancy um, it's common. 40% of pay, uh, pregnant ladies will experience pregnancy. It's due to the hormones. And it's usually because they just can't pass the stool. So often dietary advice is, is enough. And if, you, if they need a laxative, make sure you give them a bulk forming laxative and make sure they know they have to drink plenty with it. Um, as uh, advised them that it's a slow onset of action, it can cause again some flatulence and advise to have regular exercise. That's the best thing you can do for constipation is um, exercising, drinking plenty. And of course, pregnant ladies often will be on iron supplements. So, uh, you know, they might have to 
discuss with the GP if they um, still need it. Next. So really for this gentleman is um, once the osmotic or, or the um, treatment we, we prescribed or, or gave him uh, has worked, reduce it gradually. Um, you know, once the, the stool is formed, soft is softly formed and he gets it about at least three times a week, a week without straining, he can stop them. And also, I would probably ask this patient to come back on a regular basis. He's, he's one of our regulars, therefore, we will just continue asking him how he is. And as I said, you know, if this happens regularly, he might need to be referred because there could be some um, uh, issues that are going wrong with his gut. And again, it's worth discussing him with him, his dietary uh, intake and his lifestyle. Next. So the other patient I was going to discuss was a, a lady. She was 39 years uh, old. She worked in uh, a school and she uh, came to our pharmacy asking for lo uh, loperamide and cocodamol. And I was just a bit sort of concerned. So again, the questions you then ask, why would you like it? So she, of course she will tell you that she's got diarrhea and she needs to go back to work. So when did it start? What does it look like? How do you feel? And where have you been recently? We want to know the onset of symptoms. You know, is it chronic? Is it, is it uh, acute? Um, acute? Uh, how much, how bad it is? Uh, is there any associated symptoms? So her answer on the next slide. Uh, she said that she's got 10 episodes of watery diarrhea over the past 24 hours. So she's been with diarrhea um, over for 24 hours. There's no blood or mucus in her stool. She has no appetite, but she feels quite thirsty. And occasionally she gets cramping, but not really that much pain. She has two children at the local school. Um, she works in a, as a carer for older patients. And she really needs to go back because uh, like everywhere else, we have staff shortages and uh, she needs to be back at work. Next. So the most likely cause for her is it's, it's a viral or bacterial infection. Um, she has already some signs of dehydration. She feels very thirsty. And she also then on further questions said she was slightly dizzy. Um, viral and bacterial infections, or particularly viral infections, which are probably 90%, tends to be short-lived, self-limiting, and you know they don't really harm uh, our body. We, we can cope with it very well. Um, it's defined as two or more loose stools in 24 hours by the World Health Organization. Um, or also if it's just more frequent than usual and watery. So somebody who doesn't open her bowels every three days all of a sudden has daily watery stools. That's already a, 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 um, a situation for concern. So acute is if it's last, less than 14 days, persistent if it's slightly more than 14 days, and chronic if it's over four weeks. And the most important thing is really that we exclude the red flag symptoms. Next. So... The ones which are really important is if somebody comes in with a slightly longer history of diarrhea and they say they're bleeding from the rectum and they have unintentional white weight loss, then immediately we are thinking, well, is there any cancer risk? If they have abdominal mass, is there an infection, uh, an abscess, anything like that? And if they feel generally unwell with fever and are vomiting at the same time, they are at risk of severe dehydration. And if this does, if you can't manage it within a day or two, they need to go and be uh, be referred. And of course, if anybody has, uh, you know, evidence of dehydration, so tachycardia, then a really low blood pressure is confused, they need to be admitted or at least be seen by uh, uh, A&E where they can be managed properly. Um, 
Ongoing diarrhea after recent antibiotic course is never a good idea. It could be C. diff. So we need to particularly in the elderly, they cannot cope with um, dehydration as well. And immunocompromised patients also need to be seen as soon as possible. But the main thing is blood or mucus in the stool, bleeding from the rectum, un unintentional weight loss. They do need to be seen. Next. So, um, 90% of acute diarrhea is uh, an infection. Uh, most of it is particularly community acquired is norovirus or Campylobacter. And then you get obviously the, the bacteria and the parasites for travel diarrhea. So you always have to ask if these patients have been anywhere and have just returned or if they have traveled to an area, you know, where they're likely to get infected with travel diarrhea bugs. Um, other causes could be food allergies. You know, they are things like sorbitol, alcohol, uh, non uh, antibiotics, of course, can cause it. So think about that. Ask about that when, when, you, when you try to um, identify the cause. And, of course, acute inflammation, IBD, you know, uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, which are really a big issue. And these patients probably need to be seen by the specialist team if you have that. Okay, next. So with this patient, you know, the treatments are stay at home and get plenty of rest. The stay at home is really important. This lady um, has worked, is working with elderly patients. She cannot go back to work for 48 hours, however short staffed it is. Acute infective diarrhea is very, very infectious and it can just wipe out a whole care home, a whole ward. We all know about that. Um, drink lots of fluids. And again, like Ruth said, small sips, if you particularly if you feel sick, you know, have um, eat as, as when you feel able to, but not much, you know. Uh, you do not need to change, particularly if some people say, oh, just eat rice or just only something. It's no, just eat whatever you feel like, but little and probably often. Paracetamol is great. If it, you have a kid, don't, you know, check what, what before you give it to children. And as I said, keep immaculate hygiene. It's very contagious. Hand washing after going to loo, if you can change the toilets so you use only one toilet and the rest of the household the other toilet if possible and do not like ruth said in that case fizzy drinks are make it worse the same for fruit juice <clears throat> just plain tap water would be great and if you feel they they have been really dehydrated then we can look at uh, what uh, how to replace that Aspirin to children uh, is really a no-no, so please don't offer um, that, that as a painkiller to children. Um, and please don't give uh, antidiarrheals to children under 12, because children under 12 can cope very well with it. They, it will just um, resolve naturally. And if it doesn't, they need to be seen. Next. So these um, are medications that cause diarrhea. You can look at that later for, um, uh, for reference. For me in the hospital is particularly the magnesium. Lots of, of patients get, uh, are low in magnesium. So we give them magnesium and then they get diarrhea. So just be aware, you know, misoprostol is a bad one. We, we always have problems with it. Um, uh, colchicine, metformin, there's lots of them. And then, of course, there are the antibiotics. Always get a history if they had been on antibiotics or if they overuse laxatives. We have lots of patients who just use too many laxatives. Next. So how do we treat them? Really, the best treatment is ORT or ORS. So oral rehydration supplements or oral rehydration therapy. Um, because dehydration is the most common complication. The, 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 the gut, the, the colon transit is so fast, the water um, gets not reabsorbed and therefore they get very easily dehydrated. And the, uh, we need to replace the fluids and the electrolytes and therefore ORT is probably the best solution. And if you make it up, you, it has to contain in sodium uh, 
and it's about 240, 250 millions mol per litre, and um, make it up in 200 mils of water. So um, I'll show this in a minute. And store it at room temperature for up to an hour. Don't leave it longer. And if you have a fridge, please put it in the fridge. You can use it for 24 hours. It's slightly more pal palatable if it's cold. So you can tell the patients, keep it in the fridge. It's easier to drink because it tastes really sugary, salty. It's a really unpleasant taste. As we said, frequent sip sips of uh, refrigerated solution is probably the best way. And people seem to be less um, uh, choking on it. Next. So this is the uh, World Organization's ORS, uh, um, um, how to make it up. Uh, but you often don't have trisodium citrate or potassium chloride. So next, a very easy homemade WHO ORS solution is six uh, you take a litre of water, six to eight, six level teaspoons of sugar and half a, a teaspoon of salt, and you have, you're replacing the most urgent needs of um, electrolyte and uh, um, uh, water fluids if you get to sip this several times a day. Next. Um, so, it, the advice on ongoing care is in most cases, acute diarrhea resolves within five to seven days. Individual really should not return until 48 hours after their symptoms have resolved. Okay, this is to save the other people around them. And this lady works in a school. She probably picked it up from her kids. You know, it can just, uh, it's very, very contagious. And it often goes through, it uh, goes from, children to children in schools and then to adults and then um, it can be uh, contaminate, uh, contaminating anybody. If the symptoms do not re uh, resolve or improve after a week, the patient probably should be referred for further investigation. And as I said, the most important thing is good hydration, not tea, not coffee, just uh, water, or if you can make up ORT and um, or diorolite or any of the sachets that are available on the market is the best thing. And if you need to use antidiarrheals, then um, uh, they ha you have to stop um, within a day or two if, if, if you just don't open your bowels because the the risk of constipation or abdominal distension and then, you know, potential um, rupture of the colon might make a colon and um, might be a problem. Next. Pharmacological treatment. Yes, they are. They are definitely short term only. Therefore, rapid control of symptoms. So particularly travel diarrhea, particularly when they have to go on a plane or something. It might be a, a, an op um, it might be a reason why you would want to do it. But if you have an infection, you'd rather don't use them because the body just wants to get rid of the infected uh, <coughs> part. And therefore, that's why we have diarrhea. So it's much better to just get through these few days of diarrhea rather than trying to keep the stool in. Um, they have a risk of CNS depression and dependency if you use them. Uh, too long and at too high a dose. We know particularly loperamide, loperamide gets used by addicts. And if you use them too much, as we said, there's serious complications such as uh, toxic megacolon. Um, the dose is four milligrams per uh, initially, and then you, you give two milligrams after each loose stool <coughs> for a, um, a maximum of two days, up to 12 milligrams a day. As we said, they also have a report of cardiac uh, side effects at high doses and as a, you know, addiction. Codeine, uh, as before, is exactly the same. It just gets absorbed straight away and you get CNS depression and dependency much quicker if you use it chronically. So really for me, pharmacological treatment is probably only in emergency when somebody just needs to stop the diarrhea short term. Next. There are some anti-motility agents. There's the cofenotrope. Um, uh, they're only really licensed as a 
adjunct with rehydration and the effectiveness is just not there. It's just not clear if they, how effective they are. And then there's the encephalinase inhibitor, the racicadotril. Um, in the UK, it's uh, really only, uh, um, it's not really recommended and it's not available for adults. It's only available for children and the SMC uh, said it's actually not sufficient evidence. So we don't really use it and I have not got much experience with it. Antibiotics, again, you obviously would use a, um, a broad spectrum uh, gut clearing one. So you would use something like ciprofloxacin, norfloxacin, rifaximin, any of these. Again, they're not, not recommended because most of the infections are viral. But in travel diarrhea, they, they do have a place probably as prophylaxis. Next. So the other thing is really children. I know you're going to have a, a, a children's uh, um, webinar in the future. But for me, diarrhea in children is a real problem, particularly with babies. And viral gastroenteritis is fairly common in babies. And OK, there could be another reason. There could be meningitis, ear infections, UTIs, anything like that. What's important is that you recognise if mum comes with a baby, you need to recognise the red flags. If they're less than six months and it has been last longer than 24 hours, they need to be seen. The risk of rehydration is just really, really of dehydration is really high and you need to give them the oral rehydration salts straight away. Mum has to start immediately and go and get this child to be seen. If they're older than six months and it's two days, you probably have hopefully given them some rehydration salts. But if it lasts for longer than two days, again, they need to be seen. If a baby has a sunken fontanella, the, the skin tur uh, turgor is really bad, is vomiting or unable to tolerate oral rehydration, they need to be seen. Babies up to six months are particularly susceptible to dehydration. And above that, again, children, slightly older than six months also two two days of of diarrhea really will be high risk of dehydration so make sure they have their rehydration so they understand how to do it next you know they know how to make it up so tell them to stay at home and give the patient in the, the, the baby lots of rest carry on breastfeeding and bottle feeding. They need to get the liquid. And of course, they're used to bottles. They're used to breast, whichever way they are. And if they're, if they're, feed, if they're sick, try again and again. And so small feeds, maybe more often, well, more likely more often. And um, baby, children on formula, um, try and give them water sips in between the feeds. Don't make the formula weaker. You know, just prepare it the same way. Um, don't give, as we said, antidiarrheals uh, medicines if the children are under 12. And as we said, the same for aspirins for children under 16. And if it lasts longer than 48 hours, you probably need to, to seek advice. Next. Um, here for children, you know, how much should, you know, are the daily uh, requirements, which are here for your reference, make it up in freshly boiled water if the child is less than a year, because you don't want to introduce another infection. And um, as we said, probably keep it in the fridge and see um, if they uh, tolerate it better. Provide oral syringes and you can calculate the amount they have to, to take on, on the list above. Um, you can give them teaspoons or medicine spoons or um, you need to do it in a feeding bottle with very low flowing teeth because you don't want, they, they, they won't be able to tolerate a lot in one go. They just need to sip regularly. And if the child otherwise is healthy, you are not going to damage anything giving them ORT, okay? It's very unlikely the body is made to sort out the electrolytes in a healthy manner. Next. So just very quickly, I probably don't have to say too much about it, but when you have travel diarrhea, you know, make sure they understand what, how to look after themselves. 
regarding the foods and beverages, you know, that they don't take uncooked food if they are in areas where there's a high risk of infections, unpasteurized milk, cheese, anything of these water, um, you know, dairy products. Avoid water, tap water and ice cubes, make sure it's bottles which are properly sealed. Um, anything ground, grown leafy vegetables. This can all be found on um, any travel site, how to look at it. Um, store food in room temperature in warm environments, all these kind of things. Um, you know, just give them a, a, a reasonable good understanding on how uh, infections can be avoided. Um, and they can treat, obviously, explain to them that boiling water with, or treating with chlorine might properly help. And again, hand wash, hand hygiene before and after eating is really important. Next. So I hope that has sort of given you a little bit of an idea how to properly advise and manage patients with constipation and diarrhea. And I hand over to Manjiri. Much, Anya. That was wonderful. And the way you presented the case studies, I think everyone gained a lot of knowledge. And it was very interesting, both the case studies, one on constipation and uh, diarrhea. And also you touched upon the topic of children and diarrhea. I think that is very, very essential. So thank you so much. This was truly a session, which I can call it as a masterclass, a theory and the practicals. Great done. So now I request both of my speakers to open their cameras. Already Ruth is here as well as Anya. And then the, there are some questions from the audience. Thank you uh, to the audience. Thank you to the attendees for this interesting questions. So uh, one of the question is, uh, is it safe to give milk of magnesia on a routine basis to an old patient, say the age 85? So is, can it be given routinely to, to a patient who is aged 85? And uh, if it is not safe, what could be an alternative? How to manage it? So, sorry, can you start the, the question again? Was it for me? Uh, it is for both of you. Oh, you yeah. can, any one of, yeah, any one of you can take it. Uh, Ruth, you want to go first? So milk of magnesia I, and an old age patient, is it okay to take milk of magnesia on a routine basis? Maybe it's daily or frequently, a routine basis. That's what the question is. I, I mean, Ruth obviously has looked at the gourd. I just personally feel that if you need routinely um any antacid, you probably need to know the reason why and therefore need investigations with the GP. And hopefully the GP will then advise on the appropriate um, treatment because milk of magnesia, you know, your magnesium diarrhea, I've just said, <laughs> you know, is that so why it you're has to be balanced? <laughs> it's any one of, of the laxatives. That's right. So any of the laxatives on a routine basis, not recommended, find out the root cause and then uh, go for it. So the next question is, uh, how, uh, what is the relationship between the NSAIDs? How are NSAIDs and sets affecting the stomach? I mean, it could be uh, the common GI conditions or even ulcers or, yeah. yes, Ruth, can you go? Yeah, Yeah. well, NSAIDs are, are known to cause stomach ulcers. Um, so they, I, I don't know the exact um, pathogenesis as to why it happens. Um, but it is really common side effect to get things like indigestion and it and stomach ulcers. Um, I don't know if you know any more than that, Anya. Well, non steroidals are um, obviously acid. They're they're an acid. So if you have already a propensity to not have um, good stomach protection through the mucus, so if your mucus on the stomach wall is is weak, then you obviously have the problem already with that. In addition to this, they obviously prevent the prostaglandin um, production, which makes this um, gut mucus, the gut lining, and therefore this mucus will be reduced because of the non steroidals which are now acid and your gut acid in addition. That's how they cause um, 
that's how they cause the, the ulceration. So it's because they reduce the amount of mucus, protective mucus layer in the gut, plus they are also adding to being acid. So thank you. So NSAIDs have been found to be irritating to the stomach. And also they inhibit the prostaglandins, which protect our stomach. So exactly. by doing so, they cause so many of the GI symptoms. So uh, thank you. Uh, is there Can any I also just say yeah. that non-steroidals also cause ulcers lower down in the gut? I'm, I'm in our endoscopy unit. We have lots of lower gut and you know ulceration, which are due to to um to to non-steroidals. So we really don't like them. <laughs> General question to both of you. Uh, what is the role of the exercise in prevention of the constipation or the management of the constipation? Do you also recommend yoga for uh, preventing or treating the constipation? Is there any clear evidence that you have come across? Well, there is definitely clear evidence on exercise. And I suspect that any exercise and considering yoga is quite a forceful exercise. It's not, you know, you have to be really fit and it's just to increase the peristalsis. So if if you have good blood flow through everywhere and, and your your gut works, tends to work properly. And I suspect that our bodies probably also made that exercises increases the peristalsis, you know, like the veins when we walk and they, they increase. So maybe that's a similar thing. Um, I'm not a total specialist on, on, on peristalsis. There are some amazing studies on this. But exercise definitely makes a big difference. I think it helps with general well-being as well. Um, you know, you might eat better, you might drink more and things like that. That's going to help um, relieve constipation and things as well. Uh, there is one more interesting question. Is there any relationship between the continuous hiccups and IBS? Is there any connection that you have found? I don't know of a direct link, but hiccups are related to uh, reflux. Um, hiccups That's, are yeah. a, a, a symptom of quite a few different conditions, and a reflux is one of them. Um, I don't know the exact reasons for that, but I, if if somebody's got long term hiccups, I would probably look, at, you know, going to see for some investigations as to why they've got long term hiccups to get to the root cause. I mean, long-term hiccups is a is a spasm of the diaphragm, isn't it? And it can be all sorts of, like Ruth said, it can be all sorts of things. It can be, it can be psychological. It can be nervous. It can be organic reflux. Be, all that kind there of could thing. be multiple causes. True. Yeah. Drug induced. Yes. Yeah. So there is one more uh, question. Uh, so ORS, the oral rehydration salt sachets, are available with uh, zinc. So what is the rationale for giving zinc tablets with oral rehydration to children for 10 days? So in the country from where our attendees comes, in his country, he has ORS sachets uh, with 10 tablets of zinc. So it's a 10 days treatment given for children uh, along with ORS. So I- Now, I, I think zinc prevents the viral reproduction. It, I, I'm, I'm not totally sure because I saw that too, that they now re recommending zinc for, for ORSs. And I think it's to do, A, it's for healing, the, the gut lining will be healing better, which is irritated by the diarrhea. But I think it's also got an anti-infectious effect on the, on, on the gut, but I would have to look it up. So a few years ago, World Health Organization recommended the use, use of zinc in children yeah. uh, in treatment of diarrhea. And so many of these ORS are coupled with zinc or it's taken separately. Uh, so uh, there is one more question. Uh, this question to Anya. Uh, thank you for a very important and beneficial presentation. Could you please advise a detailed written guide on this issue that is freely available online I would appreciate if you could provide the link in this box. Thank you in advance. Well, 
Mikin Patel from Imperial and I have just written a PTA article, but unfortunately it's not, I don't think it's freely available. But the World Health Organization obviously has a lot around diarrhea because it's one of the big, particularly children's morbidity or and mortality in the world. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot around the, the advice you, um, I think HUK has quite a good thing on constipation, but I can I can find out where the best way is on advice, and I can put the two PJ article into the, um, into the. Uh, okay, chat great. Box. That will be helpful. Ruth, uh, do you want to add anything to this? You have shown some references. Okay, all right. So uh, there is one more question. Uh, about if the patient has been given, uh, let me read that, if the patient has been given the proton pump inhibitor, say like omeprazole or pantoprazole, and a seed syrup, and an analog prostaglandin, um, sucralfate also, along with that sucralfate, what medicine should be taken first? And what is next? So it's like proton pump inhibitor and antacid, um, sucralfate, and an analog of prostaglandin. <laughs> is there any particular sequence that you advise or it is? Proton pump inhibitor has intact. to be taken before food, right? It has to be taken on empty stomach. So it, it goes before food, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would definitely take your proton pump inhibitor before your meal and I'd take your antacid after your meal. Um, and then you need to be careful with the suckle fit when you take that. I'm, I'm not sure if it needs to be before food or with food, um, I think I'd have to have a look at that. Before, after food, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and the prostaglandin goes after food. So the proton pump inhibitor clearly before food. So this is like, it's, it's so nice that uh, people are thinking about this and I'm sure the pharmacist, we have wide scope in educating our patients in all these matters, either to take the food, I mean, before food or after food, how to sequence the medicines and, uh, the way to take it. So thank you for all these questions. And uh, I'll just check if there is any other question left out. Is there any role honey has, that's the question, in GI, in maintaining the GI health or, or causing any GI conditions? The role of honey, if it is known? I don't know. No. Okay. I probably would not have thought that much the sugar will be digested straight away, won't it? Is there anything else that's possibly helpful? It could be we use it in wounds, isn't it? We use it on wounds to 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 in create wound healing. So if you have a sore gut, who knows? Maybe that helps. But it's the sugar that does this because it feeds the 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 the, the cells. So would it do that in the gut? Because the sugar probably there are gets some studies. Bad. We need to find away, out. An interesting question. And thanks, Anya, for putting uh, more details about the use of supplementary zinc in the chat box. Thank you very much. So uh, would you like to give any specific message, one-liner, uh, role of pharmacist, and the GI conditions? Uh, you are aware that in some parts of the world, the pharmacy practice is not very advanced. And people, the pharmacists, are not uh, acting as a counselor, as well as the consumer is not expecting uh, counseling or patient-centric services. So it's both ways. So in such situation, uh, do you advise for anything specific that the pharmacist, I mean, there is not much time for the interaction also for the patient, between the patient and the pharmacist, because patient doesn't want to wait in the pharmacy for longer. So is there anything specific that you would like to tell in such uh, practice situations that we must do as a pharmacist? I mean, for me, on the whole, if you engage the patient, they're by the end quite happy to have a chat and get advice because a lot of the conditions are very, you know, not well understood and particularly diarrhea, you know, they all want to just uh, 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 anti-diarrheal, but actually the best thing is to just write it out 
for the body and if you can explain to them why and the same with constipations don't use stimulant laxatives straight away yes they're instant solutions but long term they are a problem and that's what we need to explain to the patient yes and many a times it is they just want a shortcut and they ask for an antibiotic over the counter and nobody goes for the ors and zinc but they just want something like some ciprofloxacin ofloxacin and so on so that's where that's where the role of pharmacist comes in educating the patient and uh, for the rational and the responsible use of medicines so and antimicrobial the, resistance is the big battle we are fighting we battle. should not be yes. using you know these are mainly viral infections don't give them antibiotics well said just do you want to add anything yeah i I agree with what you've said there. Um, I also think, you know, we really do need to try and find out if the patient has any red, red flag symptoms um, so that we can, you know, point them in the right direction. Failing that, just some general advice to patients about, you know, maintaining fluids and um, eating well and trying to get a bit of exercise to try and maintain good mental well-being as well as physical well-being, which should help with all aspects really. So lifestyle factors, yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, and because you have been specialized in the gastroenterology, as the pharmacist specialized in gastroenterology. So in some parts of the world, we do not have the specialist services or the specialist pharmacists. And that's why I was asking you uh, some of these questions. So thank you very much for your answers, both of you. Great uh, presentations and excellent panel discussion. So now we go to the next slide. Can we have next slide? So uh, we have, we really had wonderful presentations from both of our speakers. We learned about the GI conditions like uh, IBS, diarrhea, constipation, alcohol, uh, and also the do's and don'ts, red flag symptoms, how to handle the patient, how to deep dive into it, and then uh, educate our patients, what questions to ask, so that was really wonderful with the case studies and the theory session by Ruth and the case studies by Anya. So pharmacist has a wide scope in uh, GI conditions and preventing complications as well as giving an advice on the lifestyle factors. So thank you very much to both the speakers. Really a great session. Thank you, both of you. So to all our attendees, thank you very much for attending the uh, the session and please don't forget to watch the next event how can self care contribute to universal health coverage health care uh, and people's perspective so it happens on 9th of december at 11 uh, am central european time so so do join us again for this session on the next session on self care and thank you very much to our speakers thank you very much to uh, the fip team thank you racket and thank you very much to all the attendees for your very enthusiastic participation and your attendance here. All of you will receive the certificate soon. And thanks and see you all in the next session. Stay safe, stay well.